A very good amen. amen. Father, we do thank you tonight. We bless your name for your people, our pastors, our leaders, our overseers. Lord, we pray that everyone today will receive from you in Jesus' name. Amen. All our workers in every section, we pray, Lord, that you pour your blessings upon everyone. Amen. We're asking, Lord, as we're making use of us to touch other lives, transform other lives, you'll touch our own lives. Amen. You'll bless our families. Amen. And those who have uh, challenges with their children, or with their marriage, or with their wife, or their husband, Lord, we pray that from heaven, you perform miracle in every family in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that you forgive uh, fathers and mothers and families that have been negligent in the past. And that you repair and restore every family in Jesus' name. Amen. We're asking that tonight you speak to your people. We will keep on standing. We will keep on walking. And this work will prosper in our hands. We will be winners and will be achievers in Jesus' name. Fulfill your word in every life. In Jesus' name we pray. Praise the Lord. God bless you. And we're coming to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 22. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 22, verses 14 and 15. Acts 22, verse 14. And he said, the God of our fathers has chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth, for thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. As we look at verse 14 in particular, this was Ananias talking to Saul, Paul the Apostle. It was a time the Lord called Paul, and he called him to a special assignment. But look at the language, and he said, The God of our fathers has chosen thee. That means there's to be no doubt at all in the mind of Paul the Apostle. From that time on, until he was laid down, the sword and the sickle that the Lord had called him the Lord had chosen him there are times when doubts come in the minds of people what I'm doing am I supposed to be doing this what I'm spending my life my time on is this the appointment of the Lord for me Paul the Apostle was not to have any doubt because the Lord had chosen him in particular and thank God he has chosen you and that choice, the purpose of his choice will be fulfilled in your life. But look at this. It says that thou shouldest know his will. That thou, Paul the Apostle, shouldest know his will. Knowing the will of God has been drummed up, beaten down, spread out, and pursued in our church. And the meaning of God's will has been so limited, so restricted, and so misunderstood. The meaning of the will of God has been so distorted and completely lost by many of our members, many of our workers, many of our pastors, many of our leaders, many of our overseers. God's will is God's plan. God's will is God's program. God's will is God's purpose for each one based on his infallible knowledge. He has knowledge that is unmistakable, infallible. Knowledge about you. Knowledge about your past, about your present, about your future. Knowledge about why you were born. Knowledge about what you will be. Knowledge about what he created you for. And on the basis of that knowledge... He appoints you for what he wants you to do. His will is based on his infallible knowledge. Not only that, on his infinite wisdom. He has wisdom. He is not going to put his square peg in a round hole. He's going to put the appropriate person 
in an appropriate program at the appropriate period and for an appropriate purpose. And because of that wisdom, he has appointed each one of us. That's the wisdom he manifested. And he chose Paul the apostle in his infinite wisdom. God's will is based on invisible providence. Invisible providence, that means providence that is not known to you, not known to me. That if you were to choose anything at all, all the knowledge you have, all the experience you have, is what happened in the past and maybe what is happening now. You do not know what is going to happen tomorrow. And so we're so limited, we cannot make the right choice. But in the side of God, he has infinite wisdom. He has infallible knowledge and he knows invisible providence. God then makes his will known. Know this. God supports his will. If there is the will of God, this is the plan of God, this is the purpose of God, this is the project of God, this is the program of God, he has all the resources in heaven and on earth to support that will. It's not going to support what is not his will. It's not going to pay for what is not his will. If something is the will of Satan, God is not going to pay for that. Something is the will of society but not the will of God. God is not going to pay for that. But when something is the will of God, he supports that will. He sustains that will. He does that with all his love. With all his power, he does that with all his provision. He supports the will and sustains the will in all his faithfulness. He supports it with divine authority. He supports it with gifts and abundant supply. He looks at his will and because his will is precious to him, he girds that will. He watches over that will. He protects that will. And so you understand then how important the will of God is for him, for his kingdom, and for heaven, and for all eternity. God's will is not limited to young, unmarried believers in the church. That's how we have misunderstood the will of God. We look at, uh, you know, young people, are you praying for the will of God? I'm going to ask the adults, are you praying for the will of God? Oh, the adult tells me, sir, you don't know me again, I'm married. Because when I talk about the will of God, he thinks I'm talking about marriage. Every time we talk about the will of God, it's about marriage and marriage and marriage. I'm asking the pastor, are you praying to know the will of God? Will of God, sir, I'm married. I have children. I'm talking to mothers. I'm talking to fathers. I'm talking to overseers. And I'm asking him, how about the will of God? Are you at the center of the will of God? He says, sir, I cannot thank God enough. The wife I married, the husband I married is just so wonderful. And I just thank God every time I'm in the center of the will of God. You don't understand the will of God. God's will is not limited to young or married believers. And it is not restricted to a period of life or labor in the kingdom. Christ had to know the will of the Father. He wasn't thinking about marriage. Christ had to know the will of God. He wasn't thinking about what you are thinking about. The angels, they also need to think about the will of God. And they're not thinking about marriage. So when we're talking of the will of God, we're not necessarily talking about marriage. And thinking about the prophets, they are to know the will of God. Talk about the kings, they are to know the will of God. And talk about believers today, ministers today, we need to know the will of God, recognize the will of God and know the importance of that will of God. Look at Matthew chapter 26, the will of God. Matthew chapter 26, I'm reading from verse 42. Broad in this thing we call the will of God. Enlarge this thing we call the will of God. Deepen this thing we call the will of God. Heighten what we call the will of God. Look at chapter 26 of Matthew verse 42. It says, He went away again the second time and he prayed, saying, Oh my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it tell me 
Thy will be done. That's not marriage. Thy will be done. His sacrifice is atonement for the salvation of the whole world. Thy will be done. We're looking at Luke chapter 11 verse 2. Luke chapter 11 and we're reading from verse 2. In verse 2 it says, And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, A Father which art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, Thy kingdom come, Tell me, Where? Thy will be done in heaven, As so in earth. Who are the people doing the will of God in heaven? Are they trying to get married? No. The will of God is the purpose of God. The will of God is a project of God. The will of God is a plan of God. Whatever God wants done, that's the will of God. And it is not restricted to marriage because angels don't marry. We're looking at John chapter 4. John chapter 4. And I'm reading from verse 34. John chapter 4 verse 34. Jesus says unto them, My meat is to do, tell me, the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. You can see here, his work, the father's work, is the will of the father. That is what the father has appointed for me to do. What the father has appointed for me to be. Have you checked up? Have you found out? Because you might travel all your life to the end of the road and then you get to the end of the road and you are wondering, look at my life. All these years, 70 years, 80 years, 100 years, I spent doing this, this and that and I'm just realizing now I was not in the will of God. I was doing something. I was busy. I was sweating. I applied myself. I spent everything I've got to get this done. But I'm wondering now, is that the will of God? Is that why I came to this world? And so you need to understand, and you need to find out the will of God. But Jesus said, I spend every day doing the will of my Father. Every moment, doing the will of my Father. There's no shadow of doubt in my mind. Every moment, every interaction, every contact, every day, every assignment, every duty, every responsibility, everything I put into the will of God. My meat, my joy, my delight, my satisfaction, my fulfillment, the thing that gets me going is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, verse 22. Acts chapter 13, verse 22. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, and to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, God will find you. When he has something important to do, God will find you. When he has something that even angels cannot do, he will find you. He said, I have found David, the son of Jesse. He knows your name. He knows the name of your parents. He knows your circumstances. He knows your background. And whatever that background is, he said, I found her. I found him. And because I found her, I found, I'm not going to let her go. I'm not going to let him go. This one, this one, I want to do something that not even angels can do. That nobody on earth can do. And I find this one, I'll protect him from Satan. I'll protect him from demons. I'm going to guard him. I'm going to protect him. I'm going to watch over him. I'm going to watch over her. This one, I found this one. Satan will not misuse this one. I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, who shall fulfill, tell me, 
all my will. That's not marriage. That's not marriage. He's talking about leading the whole of Israel. He had an assignment for Israel as a nation. Because out of that nation, God will bless all the tribes and all the families of the earth. And God needed somebody, somebody special that will do what has to be done so that this nation will fulfill the will of God. And he said, I found David. Thank God he found me. I said, thank God he found me. He found you. You'll fulfill his will in Jesus' name. Look at this. Look at the start. Six. And for David, after he had searched his own generation by, tell me, the will of God fell on sleep. Look up here. That man could not die until he finished the will of God. I'm looking at somebody there. That person cannot die. I said that person will not die. Until you finish the will of God in Jesus' name. No other person will do it for you. No other person will take your place. No other person will replace you. That thing he has appointed for you to do, the reason you were born, the reason you came to this world, it must be fulfilled. Satan cannot limit that will. Satan cannot distract that will. Satan cannot destroy that will. Sickness, no matter the name of the sickness, cannot cut short this will we are talking about. The Lord is watching over you. He said, this one that I found, sickness will not take this from me. Calamity will not take this man from me. And evil will not take this woman from me. And you will fulfill that will before you fall to sleep in Jesus' name. And when you sleep, have you ever thought about sleeping? You know, sometimes you wake up in the morning. And then you go here, you go there, you walk until you are totally totally completely tired and then you, you you come back home and you look at from you know morning hours afternoon to the evening and you really watch it's like it's a special day it's like i've done what i've never done in many days and then as you review everything thank god that is settled thank god that is settled thank god that is settled and then you fall to sleep you really sleep i said you really sleep because, you know, no worry, no anxiety, and there is no confusion in your mind. There's no contradiction. It, I just thank God today was the most beautiful day. I finished everything I was supposed to finish, and then you sleep. That's how death is when you have done the work of God here on earth. And then your early years and your middle years and your late years, everything is sunk into the word of God and into the will of God. And then you fall asleep, you really sleep. That's going to be a beautiful time. And there will be no worry and anxiety. Where am I going? Will I get there? Will I not get there? Because it says, and David, after he had fulfilled the word of God, the will of God, he fell asleep. It will happen. There will be peace at your end. On those final days, there will be no anxiety and there will be no worry. Did I do the will of God? If you have not been doing it, you are going to do it today. Because he will reveal his will to you. And that will you will fulfill. We are looking at Colossians, Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. And I am reading from verse 12. Colossians chapter 4 verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you. Always laboring fervently for you. And in prayers that ye may stand perfect and complete. Tell me. In all the will of God. That she may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. How essential it is. You can see. It's very important that you know the will of God. And you fulfill that will. And after you fulfill the will. We're coming to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And we're reading from verse 36. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 36. For ye have need of patience. That after ye have done after you have done tell me somebody you are going to do the will of god i said you are going to do the will of god after you have done the will of god what follows you might receive 
the promise. And you see, the promise comes after you've done the will of God. You're not searching for how will this happen, how will that happen, how will that happen, because you are into the will of God. You are the center of the will of God. You are doing the will of God. And it says, after you've done the will of God, just rest assured all the promises of God in your life will be yes and amen. We're talking tonight on the exceptional privilege of knowing God's will. The exceptional privilege of knowing God's will. It's a great privilege. It's an exceptional privilege knowing God's will. The exceptional privilege of knowing God's will. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, the believer's discovery and discernment of God's will. The believer's discovery and discernment of God's will. He discovers it. He discerns it. He says, this is it. This is the will of God for the hour, for the present time, for me, for us, for his church. The discovery and discernment of God's will. Believers, discovery and discernment. Number two, the backsliders disregard and disobedience against God's will. The backsliders disregard and disobedience against God's will. Number three, the boundless devotion and delight in God's will. Our boundless devotion our boundless devotion and delight in God's will tell me number one one two three go tell me again the believers discovery and discernment of God's will what do you think of a person that is preparing for exam and he doesn't know about the syllabus. He doesn't know about the curriculum. He doesn't know about the appropriate textbook. And he's sweating. He's burning the midnight oil. He's burning his candle at both ends. And yet he does not even know the curriculum. How foolish that will be. Who do you think of a person that doesn't know the destination is going and yet is uh, expending energy and fuel and is expending all the resources he's got and is driving furiously, driving so fast. And then somebody stops him and says, Where are you going? Where's your destination? What do you want to reach? He says, Honestly, I don't know. He does not know the goal, he does not know where he's going, he does not know what's the will of God for him and yet he's running up and down and doing everything the very first thing is to sit down and know the will of God discover the will of God discern the will of God and then after that discernment you can now move on and get something done we're looking at Ephesians chapter 5 Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 17. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Stop. Look around. Ask yourself, am I on the right road? Where am I going? What am I doing? What am I sweating on? What am I laboring for? What do I put all my energy, all my resources to? Why am I here and here and there? Am I in the will of God? It says, wherefore. The first thing to do is that you are not unwise. You must be wise. You must be understanding what the will of the Lord is. As we think about this matter of the will of God, you are thinking about it yourself. Do I know the will of God? Again, our mind is going to marriage. And sometimes, you know, the pastors and leaders and overseers and workers, after we prayed through, we got married, we say, praise the Lord, I jumped that hurdle. Now I can relax because now I prayed, I prayed, I knew the will of God. 
And for one whole year, he doesn't pray to know what's the will of God for me? What's the plan of God for me? What's the way of the Lord for me? What's the project of the Lord for me? And if you asked him, what last did you pray about knowing the will of God? He said, I've gone through that. I'm telling you, uh, that was a challenge. That was a challenge. I prayed and prayed. And since I got through that, I am free now. But look at this. It says, be not unwise, but be understanding what the will of the Lord is. There are basic things that we know about the will of God. I'm coming to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 3. 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Who will have, tell me, tell me out loud. Who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Uh, you think about the will of God. Here is the highest will of God. Here is the greatest will of God. He wills that all men should be saved. To start with, he wills that I be saved. He wills that I be in the kingdom. You know, there are times the devil will tell some people, ask some people, are you sure you are for salvation? Are you sure that God intended to save you? Are you sure that salvation, that you are a partaker of the salvation of the Lord? Or are you just deceiving yourself? Here is the will of God. His will is that I shall be saved. I said his will is that I, I, I said I, I should be saved. That's his will. That's his will because he wills that all men should be saved. I'm looking at my neighbors and I'm wondering, I want to talk to him. But I don't want to waste my time. I don't want to waste my resources. I, I, I don't want to approach somebody and tell him about getting saved if that's not God's will for him, if that's not God's predestination for him. Oh Lord, lead me. Lead me to the people you want to save. He said, how about that one? How about that one? How about that one? Because he is willing that all men be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That means then we don't have to be wondering how, wondering why. That man belongs to another religion. God wants him to be saved. That man belongs to another denomination. God wants her to be saved. That person belongs to another church. If it's not saved, God wants him or her to be saved. Because he says, who will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And so, you can approach anyone. You can talk to anyone with the confidence, knowing that God wills that he should be saved. Second Peter chapter 3, 2 Peter chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 9. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering towards words. We're going to read this together, not willing. 1, 2, 3, go. Not willing, not willing that any should perish. You know, that sometimes that fellow is a drunkard. God is not willing that he should perish. That fellow is a prostitute. God is not willing that she should perish. God, that fellow is uh, whatever. God is not willing that anyone should perish. And there you are not having any reservation. He belongs to the occult. He's a very dangerous person. He's a very tricky fellow. He's an undependable person. Is a terrible sinner. That's why Christ came. That's why Christ died for them. Because this is the will of God that none should perish. Somebody is walking along with you in the same office. Or somebody is living in your community. God is not willing that the person should perish. The person can make fun because of his ignorance. The person can make jest of whatever you are saying because of his ignorance. But God is not willing that he should perish. Understand, understand. Why it not for the grace of God, you'll be jesting like he's jesting. Am I right? 
Were it not for the goodness of God, you'd be joking with the spiritual things like he is joking. And you got saved. Anybody got saved there? I said you got saved. He will get saved. She will get saved. Because God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. How many should come to repentance? All. We're looking at Isaiah, the will of God. Isaiah. We're reading from chapter 45 and verse 22. Isaiah chapter 45. We're reading from verse 22. Look unto me and be ye saved. How many people? All the ends of the earth. Look unto me and be ye saved. All the ends of the earth. That's the will of God. If that were not his will, he'll not tell them, he'll not tantalize them and just tell them, look unto me. And then when they're looking, they're disappointed. No, God is not like that. He's a loving God. He's a merciful God. He's a faithful God. And he says, look unto me and be you saved of the ends of the earth. For I am God and there is none else. There is none else. That means then you need to do something. You need to tell the people who do not know. Some people do not know that God wants them saved. That God wills for them to be saved. You need to tell them. We're looking at um, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 33. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 33. Even as I please all men, look, you see that all men, all men in all things, not seeking my own advantage, my own profit, but that, but the profit of many that they might be saved. Uh, Paul the apostle said, I don't have any problem going anywhere. I go to the regions beyond. I go to the Gentiles. I go to the heathen. I go to the Athenians. I go to the people that are serving the unknown God. I go everywhere. You know why? Because I know it is the will of God that everyone should be saved. Look at your district church and look at all the surrounding places. Look at all those people you pass, young and old men and women. Look at those idol worshippers. Look at those occultic people. Look at the people that close the road uh, for their festivities and everything they do. Look at the people that are walking in the night and look at the people that stand at the crossroads and look at the people you read about and you are disgusted about their lives, their sinners. Does God want them to be saved? Is it the will of God that they be saved? Somebody must tell them. Somebody must tell them. The person who knows the will of God should tell those people that do not know the will of God that the will of God for you is that you be saved. We're coming to Jonah, Jonah chapter 1. In Jonah chapter 1, we're reading from verse 1. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. For their wickedness is come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fear thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish. From the presence of the Lord. Verse 4. But. Somebody tell me. But the Lord sent. Tell me. Sent out a great wind into the sea. Look up for a moment. Why would God do that? I told you already. He's protecting his will. Is guarding his will. Is securing his will. The will of God is that nobody should be lost. Look at the Ninevites. The wicked. The violent. The destructive. And the Lord sent Jonah to them so that his will will be fulfilled. 
But Jonah, not knowing the will of God, he's, he was an Israelite. And he didn't want those pagans, those heathens, those wicked people, those violent people. He didn't want them to be saved because he knew that God was a God of mercy. If he goes to declare to them the judgment of God, they might change their mind. They might repent. And Jonah didn't want that. Therefore, he ran away and God ran after him. And God sent a storm, great wind against him, protecting his will, preserving his will. You are the will of God. I said you are the will of God. And that thing God wants you to do, because of his love, he'll make you do it. You try to dodge, you knock your head against the wall. You try to dodge, you kick against the bricks. You try to dodge, life becomes unbearable because of God's love for you. Because anytime, if you are the center of the will of God, everything will work smoothly. But if you try to bend this way, there are goats there, there are bricks there, there are nails there that will pinch you and make life uncomfortable. And then you say, God, why? You're asking me why? Why? Why are you running away from my will? Why are you not doing what I created you for? Why do you want to occupy the land and you are not paying your rents? Why do you want me as your landlord to provide accommodation for you here on earth and then you will not pay your house rent by obeying me? And so he sent out a kind of a great wind into the sea and there was a mighty tempest in the sea so that the ship was like to be broken. Then uh, the mariners were afraid, and they cried every man uh, unto his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea, to lighten each of them. Look up here. All those things the people were trying to do, will that stop the storm? No. We'll waste a lot of resources. We waste a lot of our treasures. We waste a lot of money. We waste a lot of our income. We waste a lot of our property. Because the storm, there's a reason for the storm. There's a reason for fighting against them. And they were throwing what they had into the sea. And God said, I'm not interested in that. I don't want to waste your property. I don't want you to lose what you've got. My man is there in your boat. He must do my will. I'm protecting my will. I'm preserving my will. If that man remains there, you can fast from now until the following year. And you can do whatever you want to do. If that man is there and you don't release him to me so that I will tell him why I created him, whatever you do will not solve the problem. You know what? If you're in the will of God, Sicknesses will run away from you. I say sicknesses will run away from you. Demons will run away from you. He will make you strong. What do you think? What do you think you have? He has a work to do and you are the man and you are the woman. He must keep you strong. He must keep you healthy. He must keep you protected. He must keep you preserved and he must provide for you so that you can do his will. All you need to do is be at the center of that will. Everything will be all right. And whatever was not all right before today, from today, everything is going to be all right. Look at it now in verse, uh, the latter part of verse 5. But Jonah was gone down into the side of the ship. He lay and was fast asleep. Then so the ship master came to him and said, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God. If so be that God will think upon us, that will perish not. Knowing the will of God is very important. And doing that will is very important. You see, Jonah went down and he slept. But the sleeping did not solve the problem. I take it off my mind. I close my eyes. I block it out of my memory. I'm going to just relax. You can take sleeping tablets. 
your, when you wake up from the sleeping tablets, you'll find the storm there. The solution is to do the will of God. The solution is to say, Lord, I surrender. The solution is to say, I know you created me for a purpose. I didn't bring myself into the world. You brought me here for this plan, for this purpose, for this project, and for this will. Lord, I will do it. You will do it. And then everything will be over. You know the story of Jonah? Eventually they cast lots to know who is uh, this happening to us. And they found it was Jonah. And he said, what have you done? He said, actually, I'm running away from God. Why did you do that? What are we going to do now? What did he tell them? I said, what did he tell them? Throw me into the river. Let me die. I would rather die than do that will of God than go to Nineveh. Whoever fought with God and won. Nobody. So they threw him. The moment they threw him into the sea, what happened to the storm? The storm stopped. Some people think if they're going to solve a particular problem, the only thing they do is prayer, prayer, prayer. If the problem is not solved, they go to the mountain, prayer, prayer, prayer. If the problem is not solved, they look for prophets, prayer, prayer, prayer. And if the prayer is not answered, they look for every means, the right prayer request, the right everywhere, prayer, prayer, prayer. But you know what? Just go back to God and say, God, what you created me for on earth, whatever it is, I'm going to do it. That solves the problem. You become well. Your storm will stop. The calamity will come to an end. All the things you are asking for, all the things, I want this, I want this, I want God said, I've been waiting for you, I'll give you. No problem. Because I'm going to provide enough for you to be happy so that you will do my will. All you need to do is say, Lord, I will do your will. Everything will be all right in your life. And what's that will of God? That is to show the people that salvation is for them. To show the people they don't have to die. We're coming to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 21. The will of God. Luke chapter 14 verse 21. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house being angry and to said to his servant go out quickly into the, into the streets. This is the will of God. And to the lanes of the city, this is the will of God, and bring in thither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. That's the will of God. Look at verse 22. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. It is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. In verse 23, the Lord said unto the servant, tell me, go out into the highways and to the hedges and what? Tell me, tell me. Compel them to come in. Open your mouth and talk to them. Use your wisdom and talk to them. All the language, everything you ever learned at school, in using the language, talk to them. All the wisdom you have, talk to them. Everything you can say, everything you can remember, to compel them to the decision of coming in, tell them, because that's my will. You know, that's what the Lord wants us to do. Instead of using all the wisdom we've got in the market, all the wisdom we've got in a trade, all the wisdom we've got in business, he said, this is what I created you for. All those other things, they're just additions. All those other things, they're just some remunerations. But this one, to tell the sinner to come into the kingdom, that's what I created you for. Therefore, go out and use everything I've given you as talent, as skill, as communication, as management, as organization, everything I've given you, and use that to compel them to come in that my house may be filled. We will we'll do it. I said we will do it. We're coming to point number two, the backsliders disregard and disobedience against God's will. The backsliders disregard and disobedience against God's will. Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, 
Verse 46. In verse 46, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? I reveal my will to you. Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? I died for those sinners, and I told you to go and tell them because they don't know. Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? I don't want any sinner to perish. I want all the sinners to be saved. And you call me Lord, Lord, and you go for night vigil, and you go for worship, and you go for this, and you go for that. You say you are worshiping me. You are my Lord. You are my Lord. You sing choruses. You do everything. Why call me Lord, Lord? Lord, and do not the things which I say. You spend time, you go for camp meeting, you go for convention, you go for this, you go for that, but the sinners are there, and you're feeding fat every time. I want to go and hear the word of God. What does God have to say to me? I want to go and worship God. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? And you spend all your time I had before I want to go and hear again. I benefited before I want to go and benefit again. I love the word of God. I love the worship of God. I love Lord, night vigil, a uh -huh, night vigil. Why do you call me Lord, Lord? And the things I appointed you for, and the things that is my will, you will not do. And do not the things which I say. You see, that's the attitude of the backslider. They ate before they want to eat again. They drank before they want to drink again. They were happy before they want to be happy again. They're only thinking about themselves. Lord, speak to me. Lord, speak to me. The one I spoke to you yesterday, what have you done with that? Lord, talk to me. Reveal your mind to me. The revelation I gave you yesterday, what have you done with that? He wants you to go out. He wants you to do the will of God because he's asking, why are you calling me Lord, Lord, and you're not doing the thing which I say in Proverbs chapter 14. Proverbs chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 14. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 14. Are you there? Proverbs, Proverbs. What chapter? And what verse? Hurry up, hurry up. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 14. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. You understand? We, uh, when we talk of backsliders, we think of backsliders, he's gone back to smoking, he's gone back to drinking, he's gone back to the old girlfriend, he's gone back into the old, to the old boyfriend, he's gone back to what Lina see, she's putting on this, she's putting on that. But you know the backslider in God's sight, the one that is filled with his own ways. It doesn't look at the way of God. It doesn't look at the will of God. It doesn't look at the mind of God. It doesn't look at the pleasure of God. It's filled with his own self-satisfaction. What he wants. What he desires. His own happiness. That's the backslider. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. And a good man shall be satisfied away from himself. A good man is the one that is not thinking of his own needs, his own desires, but is satisfied with the Lord. Look at Jeremiah chapter 42. Jeremiah chapter 42. And we're reading from verse 1. Jeremiah chapter 42. We're reading from verse 1. Jeremiah, hurry up. Jeremiah chapter 42, verse 1. Can I begin to read? It says, Then all the captains of the forces and Johanan, the son of Kerea, and uh, Jezaniah, the son of Hoshiah, and all the people from the least even to the greatest came near and said unto Jeremiah the prophet, Let we beseech thee, our supplication be accepted before thee and pray for us unto the Lord thy God even for all these remnants for we are left but few of many as thine eyes do behold us look at verse 3 that the Lord thy God may show us the way wherein we may walk and the thing that we may do what did they want Jeremiah to pray about? That they may know the way they will walk and also the thing that they will do. Is that right? Okay. And Jeremiah eventually prayed. Look at chapter 44, verse 16. Chapter 44, verse 16. As for the word that thou was spoken unto us, how? 
Tell me out loud. In the name of the Lord, what follows? That's backsliding. That's backsliding. They told Jeremiah, go and find out the will of God. Go and find out the way of God. Go and find out what he wants us to do and where he wants us to walk. And Jeremiah went to find out. And he came to them and he said, Thus says the Lord. Then they replied him, Jeremiah, we have no doubt that's the word of God. Jeremiah, we have no doubt that's the will of God. Jeremiah, we have no doubt you're speaking from the mouth of God. We're convinced. But you know what, Jeremiah? We will not do it. Look at verse 16 again. As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us, tell me, in the name of the Lord, tell me what follows. We will not hearken unto thee, but we will certainly do whatsoever sin goeth forth out of our own mouth. That's backsliding. That's backsliding. Somebody has not left the church, he's still in the church. He hears the word of God and he says, yes, I know. That's the word of God. There's no doubt about that. I'm convinced. Everything is logical. I see it in the Old Testament. I see it in the New Testament. And I see that this is the word of the Lord. There's no false doctrine here. Everything is plain. But I will do what's in my own mind. I know that's the word of God. I'm going to set that word of God apart. I'm going to concentrate on what I want to do. What gives me personal delight and personal pleasure. That's backsliding. That's backsliding. When we disregard the will of God, and when we reject the will of God, and when we say, let the sinners perish, let them go to hell, let them perish, even though Christ died for them. I have my own agenda. I have my own business. I have what I want to do. I'm not cut out for that. That thing is not easy for me to do. That thing the Lord is asking, you know, do this, tell the sinner, and tell the bachelor, bring them in. I don't want to do that because I have my own goal. That's backsliding. And these people were backsliders. We're looking at Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 31. Ezekiel chapter 33. And we're reading from verse 31. Ezekiel chapter 33. Reading from verse 31. In Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 31, it says, And they come unto thee as the people cometh. And they sit before thee as my people. And they hear thy words, but they will not do them. They hear, but they will not do them. They hear, but they will not do them. Their problem is not the language of the Bible. They understand. Their problem is not the presentation of the word. They understand. Their problem is not being convinced. They were convinced. The problem is not that, you know, it had not been made clear and made plain to them. It was clear. It was plain. Only that they will not do them. For with their mouths they show much love, but their heart goes after their own covetousness. We're coming back to Jonah. Coming back to Jonah chapter 1. Jonah chapter 1. And we're reading from verse 3. Jonah chapter 1, verse 3. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And he found a sheep going to Tarshish. So he paid the fear thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. You see here, he had the money. The money to go to Nineveh was not the problem. He had money. And the boat to go was not the problem. He knew the road. He knew the things to do. What the Lord is telling us is not an impossible thing. Huh? Tell the sinners, they're living around you. Then your world, then your office, then your market, then your community, then your streets, they're everywhere around you there. Go tell them that Jesus died for them. 
You read it in the Bible. You sing it in crosses. You sing it in the hymns. You sing it every time. And then you prayed about it. You've told other people to you. You've tried it before. You've done it before. But now for you to understand that this is the main thing. And this is the major thing. And go and tell them. And the Lord is saying now, readjust and reorganize your time. Readjust and reorganize your priorities. And concentrate on this. And go and tell them, Jesus died for the sinners so they will be saved and then will become Jonas. Jonah was a prodigal prophet. A prodigal prophet. The prodigal son is the one that left home and then he went to a faraway country and then until the problem started over there then he came back. Some people are sleeping servants. You know Jonah, he went to sleep. Servant of God, he was a sleeping servant. Instead of rising up and talking to the people and showing them this is the will of God, a prodigal prophet, a sleeping servant, a minimized minister. A minimized minister. You see, the sailor came to him and said, Wake up, thou sleeper. A person that should be higher than that, a person that should be on the mountaintop, talking to the people in the valley, a person that should be high, talking to the people down there, and then they now came to him, and they woke him up, and they said, Thou sleeper, wake up. He became a minimized minister. You know, when you want to minimize something, it's like, you know, you lose the value. It's not as important. You don't want it to occupy your screen, and therefore you just minimize it. How many of us are minimized? That as God has placed you up there, and he has said, this is my work for you, and this is my assignment for you, you became a prodigal preacher. You became a sleeping servant. You became a minimized minister. We have men in the church become misdirected men. Misdirected men. They are men, and these are the men God said, I'll pour my spirit upon. And then they will witness unto me, which in Jerusalem, until ye be do apart from on high. And then he says, I'm sending you forth. You'll be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the utmost part of the earth. But now we'll become misdirected men. Misdirected men. Look at what they told Stephen to do. To be distributing food, misdirected. Look at what they told Philip to do. And they were happy. They were happy. Because after all, I'm now a deacon. After all, I'm now uh, doing something in the house of God. That's not why you are filled with the Holy Ghost. And when the persecution drove them away, then Philip was in Samaria. And he preached the word of God, Jesus unto them. Demons were cast out. Uh-huh. It's now redirected. But there are misdirected men. Look at our men in the church. Like Jonah, they're just there. And they're not useful. We're going to be useful. And I said we're going to be useful. Other people, they become wavering women. Wavering women. They, they cannot stay on the job the Lord has called them to do. They, they are not stable. They are not solid. They are not so winning. They are not witnessing. They are not doing what they ought to do. And yet the prophecy said, I'll pour my spirit upon the men and upon the women, upon your sons and upon your daughters. Eventually those sons became silent sons. We can't hear their voice. They've lost their voice. They've lost their authority. Silent sons. And like Jonah, he was totally silent. The storm was on. He could solve the problem. It was because of him all those problems were there. He was silent until they woke him up. And even when they woke him up, the thing to do, he didn't tell them how to worship the Lord. But you'll find, as you read Jonah chapter 1, when they threw him uh, overboard, and then the storm stopped, then the people, they worship God. The people called upon God, upon the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But he was a silent son. The daughters, he said, I'll pour my spirit upon your sons and upon your daughters. The daughters have become dodging daughters. Dodging daughters. They dodged the work of God. 
the dodge the evangelism they dodge the soul we need it is like this is what we are supposed to do this is what we are supposed are you sure that's what you are supposed to do are you sure what you are doing will bring salvation to Nineveh are you sure that what you are doing will bring eternal life to the people that are perishing then uh, we have miserly members. Miserly members. You see our members, they don't think about themselves. They don't think about those who are perishing. If they give offering at all, they give something, how many people are actually paying their tithes and offering? How many people are making real contribution to this move of the Lord we're talking about? But the members have become miserly members. But the Lord is saying, uh, all that is the path of backsliding. We're waking up and coming back. I said we're waking up and coming back. You think about your life and you think about uh, the progress of the word of, of work of God. There are people that do nothing. Jonah, he did nothing. There are people that give nothing. All these people are throwing their wares into the sea. And Jonah just led there, did not touch anything that he had, but they give nothing. They add nothing. Are you, as you are in the church, are you adding value to the church? Are you adding to the growth of the church? Can you say, praise the Lord, that church is going from 100 to 110, and that's my convert there. Those workers are moving from 20 to 23, and that's my convert there. Are you adding? Some people do nothing. Some people give nothing. Some people add nothing. Some people contribute nothing. We're getting land for the new church there. They contribute nothing. They build, we're building a local church there. They contribute nothing. We're having this done, having this done. They contribute nothing. Some people sow nothing. We're sowing the seed. We're sowing the word of God. We're sowing here. We're sowing there. We're sowing the tracts there. We're sowing the word of God there. We're sowing something there. They sow nothing. We're reaping. They reap nothing. And these people, they seek none. They teach none. They win none. Until somebody went there and woke up Jonah. The Spirit of God will wake you up. Will alert you. And will send you forth. And you know, some people say, I don't know how to preach. You can preach. Look at Jonah. Look at Jonah. He went to Nineveh. And when he got to Nineveh, what did he say? Yet, tell me. I said, yet 40 days. And Nineveh shall be. What did he say next? I said, what did he say next? Yet 40 days. And Nineveh shall be overthrown. What did he say next? Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. What did he say next? Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Is that how to preach? I said, is that how to preach? He didn't talk about mercy. He didn't talk about forgiveness. He didn't talk about repentance. Did the people repent? Of course. Did they receive mercy? Of course. Were they forgiven? Of course. Were they saved? Of course. Were they spared? It's not your preaching. It's your obedience. He didn't know to preach and just went about, just went about yet 40 days. Nineveh shall be overthrown without talking about repentance, without talking about mercy, without talking about love, without talking about salvation, without talking about God sparing them. But the people repented. Go and tell them what you know. They will repent. Go and say what comes to your mind, they will repent. Go and tell them it is not the will of God that anybody should perish. They will not perish in Jesus' name. Point number three, point number three, our boundless devotion and delight in God's will. Our boundless devotion and delight in God's will. You will rejoice in God's will. You will do God's will. You will preach the word of God. And this word of God will prosper in your life, in your ministry, in Jesus' name. We're looking at Psalm 40, Psalm 40. I'm reading from verse 8. Psalm 40, verse 8. I, 
I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. That's what to tell the Lord, I delight to do thy will. I delight to do thy will. You will do that will of God. We're looking at Psalm 103, Psalm 103, verses 20 and 21. Verses 20 and 21, Psalm 103, Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. The angels are doing the will of God. And the Lord has taught us how to pray, Thy will be done as in earth, so in heaven. We will do that will of God. And that will of God will do it from the heart. Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6, we're reading from verse 6. Ephesians chapter 6, we're reading from verse 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 6. Not with high service, as men please us, you'll be God please us. You'll be Christ please us. Not with high service, as men please us, but as the servants of Christ doing as the servants of Christ doing as the servants of Christ doing the will of God from where? From your heart. The Lord will confirm that. You'll do the will of God. You preach to the sinners. You preach to the backsliders. You bring them back home in Jesus' name. And the Lord Himself will make you a steadfast son. You'll be a diligent daughter. You'll be a dutiful disciple. You'll be a contributing Christian. You'll be a fruitful follower. You'll be a transformational teacher. You'll be a soul winning saint. You'll be a multiplying minister. That's the call of God for life and you will do it. Your life will be useful. You will forgive the negligence of the past. Today is the day the Lord has made. You will rise up and go forth and do the will of God in Jesus' name. And this work will prosper in your hand. You will not be barren. You will not be unfruitful. Souls will come to the kingdom of God. And churches will be planted. The will of God will be done. I am ready. I said I am ready. Somebody there, I am ready. Acts of the Apostles, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, we're looking at verse 4. Therefore, therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Now, it's your turn. As you go, you preach the word of God. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord give heed unto those things which Philip spake they will listen to you. They will respond to you. Hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Look at that. You are going to become a miracle worker. As you pray, God will answer that prayer with miracle. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them. And many, taking with palsies, and that were lame, were healed. And there was... And there was, and there was great joy in that city. In our cities, there will be great joy. In our communities, there will be great joy. And you bringing the word of salvation to the people will be the source of the joy of the communities. Rise up and tell the Lord, I'll be part of this, I'll be part of this, I'll be part of this. You are part of this. You are part of this. This is the will of God. This is the will of God. That you may know the will of God and do the will of God. Your time has come. All mountains are going to move away. All problems are going to be solved. As you do the will of God, you are going to find out miracles will be happening around you in your life, in your family, and all those things you desire, the Lord will do for you. Open your mouth and tell the Lord.